dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace are yours this day in our risen Savior. Amen. Today our gospel lesson contains what is likely the best known parable of Jesus. Throughout our culture as a whole, people have an understanding of this story. Well, at least most of us do. Maybe if you are quite young or newer to the faith, you haven't maybe heard the full reading of this story before. But likely, you know a little bit about the story and its implications about loving our neighbor just from living. But sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake and we don't always understand things, or if we're quite young, we don't always understand the ramifications of certain stories. And so it takes a little while for this information to run around our heads. And this was the case one Sunday morning when a youngster uh, was sitting with his folks in church, busily coloring and munching on Fruit, Lip, Fruit Loops, keeping quiet during the sermon, much to his parents' uh, great joy, because this was not his regular thing. He was an active young man, quite bright, and was always engaged. So during the sermon, the parents were happily listening to the preacher, and it was a message on the same lesson, and he was passionate about this lesson. And he would use this refrain in his sermon over and over again. And who is your neighbor? And he would build these cases up and he'd go back to that refrain about who is your neighbor? After he had asked this question several times, the young man was then busy coloring in his book and you could see him if you were looking at him mumble something under his breath. And his mother shot him a look and he went back to his coloring. But well, the preacher went on and on, making point after point about what God was talking about in this lesson and using this refrain, and who is your neighbor? Finally, the young man got distracted enough, he got up and he whispered something in his mother's ear. She nodded no, told him to sit back down, and he did so dutifully. But he was so distracted at this point, he couldn't get back to his coloring. And the preacher was going, he was building up a full head of steam now, he's coming in towards this big conclusion. And again, he asked this question, and who is your neighbor? Finally, the little guy had enough. He couldn't take it anymore. He stood up in the pew and yelled at the top of his lungs, Mr. Rogers! <laughs> Fred Rogers, of course, is a wonderful neighbor from Mr. Na Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. A wonderful show. And it's been 2,000 years since this question was asked, but it is as relevant today as it has ever been. And Mr. Rogers, unfortunately, isn't around anymore. Now, I'm not one who tends to preach things like Law and Order rips them from the headlines for their TV shows. I like to be topical, I like to be relevant, but I like to do it in broad strokes, because each of you lives lives that is a little different than mine. And I want something that's applicable to your lives in general, so that the gospel may speak to you personally, so that this relationship you have with your Savior may grow. Because oftentimes what is in the headlines one day is gone the next. It's a flash in the pan. Until it's not. Your family in Christ, this is getting old. From south to north, from east to west, from Alton Sterling to Philando Castile, from the Pulse in Orlando to Dallas, from Black Lives Matter posts to All Lives Matter posts on the internet, we are letting fear and limits on love stop us from being who God has created us to be. And along the lines of the song that our choir sang so well today, there's a meme on Facebook lately that shows the iconic image of Uncle Sam pointing. And he's saying, I want you, which is a typical phrase for this Uncle Sam poster. And then the words say, to stop being afraid. Then there are different words, depending on the poster's political point of view. But the message is generally the same, right and left. In the face of all this violence, divisiveness, and this political nitpicking, Something is terribly wrong. And then there's a tagline at the very bottom that says, you're an American, start acting like it. Today in our Gospel lesson, in our New Testament lesson from Colossians, they couldn't be suited any better or timed any better for the week that we've had. 
if we could have a poster of Jesus pointing to us and saying, in the face of all this divisiveness and pain and violence, there is something terribly wrong here. You are Christians. It's time to act like it. It's time to act like you, who you already are in your baptisms. You are justified by God in Christ. It's time to begin acting like little Christs in this world for the sake of all. With that in mind, today we have a different Sam. He's not good Sam, he's a good Samaritan. So, a little interaction maybe with all that in mind. With the good Samaritan, we know the story as I mentioned before. So what, what comes to your mind when I say the phrase good Samaritan? And this is good Lutheran interaction time, so prepare yourselves. So what comes to mind when I say good Samaritan? I'm getting down here so I can hear you guys a little better. Hmm? Helping others. Helping others. Passion. Compassion. Good. Anything else? Good neighbor. Good neighbor. All right, that's three for a Sunday morning. That's not too bad. All right. <laughs> My first thing, though, is when I see when I when I first see Good Sam come up anywhere these days, I think of a couple of different things. One of them is a ministry that we do here at St. John. It's a wonderful ministry. It's called the Good Samaritan Ministry. And every year, believe it or not, you, through your offerings and your gifts here at St. John, help hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people pay their electricity bill when things are tight, repair their cars when there's no money so they can get to work to provide a living for their family. It's a wonderful ministry of this church, and you help lots and lots of people simply by your gifts of tithes and your donations and your participation here at church. It's a great ministry and you should pat yourself on the back for it. And then I thought a little deeper about this. What else comes to mind? I remember as a child going with my father to the Good Samaritan home in Westbrook, Minnesota. All right? And there you see the old people wondering, you know, and I knew the story well enough that the Good Samaritan was set up to help people who had been beat up alongside the road. And I thought, man, getting old is tough. <laughs> Um, all right, I was a strange kid, but that's the way those things go. Um, then you Googled, I Googled Good Samaritan, then, and you come up with this huge list of things. A story about someone who found a child in a dumpster and rescued them. There's a thrift store that's out there that's a Good Samaritan thrift store. There are physical therapy organizations and nursing home facilities, like I mentioned before. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, then there's that guy who's on the back of RVs with the halo on his head, you know. That's one of the first things that comes to my mind when I think of actually Good Samaritan or Good Sam anyway. And then there are the Good Samaritan laws. So this, this is ingrained into our culture. We understand this concept of being a Good Samaritan, or at least we think we do. An interesting thought happened to me this last week as I was going through this text, and I preached on this a number of times. But I noticed for the first time, or at least I remembered at least as I was reading through this text, that nowhere in this text does the word good actually show up. The Samaritans never called good. It is simply something we have titled this story. We have given him the title of the Good Samaritan. Because what's interesting is there's almost no good in this story whatsoever. You see, tragedy, Injustice, bigotry, plain old violence, these things are nothing new. The scriptures, in fact, are full of these stories and lament for them as well. One of the problems that's inherent in these situations is what happens when we see these things happening around us or what we fail to do. When we fail to fully engage, when we fail to fully see what is going on, when we fail then to be drawn close to those who are vulnerable or who are falling, well, this is nothing new. But what is unique about this story, something that Jolene said, is that word compassion. Maybe, in fact, this should not be known as the good Samaritan, but the compassionate Samaritan. The man in the ditch had been violated, beaten, and robbed. He was left as rubbish on the side of the road. Others, good people, mind you, very likely very nice people, saw the man but did not have compassion. Now, maybe they felt a little sorry for him, but that was about as far as it goes because 
there were things to do, agendas to be held up, stuff, to, rules to keep, and they didn't want to get involved. So they passed by on the other side. That is, until the Samaritan comes along. He sees, and he moves towards the one who is hurt, and then he does something. He acts. This action, my friends, is at the very core of compassion. You see a need, and you move close to the one in need, and you do what you can. We don't know if the guy in the ditch ever got better. We don't know if the Samaritan's work changed anything in that world. But what we do know is that the Samaritan did what he could. Now remember the lawyer's question. And this is not like an attorney lawyer, this is a religious lawyer who knows the law. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this is an odd question in the first place. Because what do you do to inherit anything? You simply are. I may inherit something when my parents die, that is if they don't spend it all in Arizona, all right? They keep going on cruises and stuff, and this, this is my inheritance you're spending. That's a whole other story. But inheritances are given. There is nothing that you do other than be, and we are born into God's family in baptism. We inherit this as the very children of God. So Jesus asks him this other question. Instead of answering him directly, he asks another question. He says, what does the law say? And the lawyer answers really well. In Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we have this phrase called the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. It's beautiful and it's right on. Beautiful, Jesus says. You've hit the nail on the head. But then the lawyer adds this. Well, who is exactly my neighbor? And instead of answering him directly, instead of answering him with another question, he tells this story. It's this beautiful story that we've talked about of the Samaritan. And he goes through this whole story. And then the religious lawyer has to concede that the true neighbor in this story is the Samaritan, except for his hate for the Samaritans is so strong, he won't even utter their name. So when Jesus asks him who was the neighbor, he says, the one who showed mercy. Cringing all the while, I'm sure. Here's the kicker. Jesus then says, go and do likewise. Now scripture doesn't tell us the lawyer's response, the story ends right there. But I think he may have said something along the lines of, uh-oh. Because you know what's happening here? This is life. And I know this. Because when it comes to this phrase, wanting to justify himself, he wasn't asking for a mission. He wasn't asking for a target to shoot for. He wanted to know what the limits of love were. And Jesus lays his self-interested focus bare in this story. There is no self-justification possible. You see, if we justify ourselves, then there is no reason to care for the other. We don't need to know who our neighbor is, because that is none of our concern. In this life, if we are self-justified, we don't care what happens in Falcon Heights, or in Dallas, or in anywhere else. Because if we have justified ourselves, we are an end to ourselves. Our navel becomes the center of our universe. And as long as I've got mine, I'm okay. This story ultimately is an indictment of each and every one of us. We spend so much time fussing about who is right and who is wrong and how we should voice our concern about whose life matters. And we don't do a ding-dong thing. We pass by on the other side. When we get hung up on this debate, and, and oh, how we get hung up on these things, taking sides, it's just another form of passing on the other side. We are so busy riding on our high horses that we never get close. And because we don't get close, we can never reach out in love. And unless we do that, we will never make a difference as the Samaritan did. And we can never go and do likewise. We get defensive when we hear these things, whatever our side may be. And then in our arrogance, in our purity, in our surety, we are so sure of our point of view is right that not only do we not help those in need, we miss seeing the very presence of God in our neighbors, and yes, even in our enemies, and yes, even in people who are completely different from us, who live half a world away. 
When we live in fear, we pass by on the other side. When we ride on our moral high horses, we risk missing the very real work of God in this world. I read in an article on this passage that stated the following. God always comes where we least expect God to be because God comes for all of us. That means both the self-justifying lawyer and the Samaritan. The Black Lives Matter folks, the All Lives Matter folks, the Blue Lives Matter folks, no one, no one is beyond the pale of God's mercy, grace, and redemption. Remember a few weeks back, Pastor Dom highlighted that a section of Luke just prior to this, Jesus sets his face to go towards Jerusalem. Everything that he says and everything he does, he does with that in mind. You see, there he will not only suffer and die on the cross to show us how far God will go to draw close to us, to demonstrate God's love for us, but he will also forgive those who crucify him. No one, no one is beyond the reach of God's love, not one. Today, Jesus shows us this by using the most unlikely of characters to serve as an instrument of God's mercy and grace and exemplify Christ-like behavior. It shouldn't surprise us. That's what God does. That's what God has always done. God chooses people no one expects and does amazing things through them. Even a Samaritan, even a small baby in the waters of baptism, even me, even you. Pray with me. Gracious Lord, there is so much to do. So much that needs mending, healing, and loving. If we were to do this on our own, it would drive us to despair. Instead, let the needs of your creation drive us into the arms of your Son, the Christ, who empowers us to see, to approach, and to do what we can in his name. Forgive us when we fall short, and empower us when we feel weak. All of this we pray in the name of the one who alone justifies us, the Lord Jesus, who came near to us to do what we cannot.